Welcome to a new episode of Cheaters Always Cheat. Like, subscribe, and share to stay connected. In my early 30s, I'm happily married to Kara, who's a bit younger than me and works in advertising. I'm a big shot at a big company. We met online, and after a while, decided to get married. We're not all mushy-gushy, we like our space and aren't always super lovey-dovey. Recently, though, I've been feeling kind of off. See, Kara's job has these really unpredictable hours, which I totally get. But lately, something's been nagging at me, you know. So, I tried talking to her about it, hoping we could figure things out together. But she kind of just brushed it off, saying I was overthinking things. It left me feeling even more confused. Last year, my nephew Julian, fresh out of college, was looking for work in film stuff. He asked Kara for help, and even though her company wasn't hiring, she tried to help him out. But then, out of the blue, her company offered Julian a job. Weird, right? Kara told him not to take it, saying the place was terrible, which she'd never mentioned before. When I asked her about it, she said it was because of one guy at work, which didn't make sense because she'd never talked about him being a problem before. Then, when I talked to Julian, he said he was still thinking about the job and wanted to check things out for himself. Fast forward a bit, and Kara comes home super mad because Julian took the job anyway. She went off about how nobody respects her in my family. I mean, Julian's an adult, he can make his own choices, right? Kara's usually pretty strong-willed, which I admire, but sometimes it can be a bit much. Still, she's usually right about stuff, so I trust her instincts. When Kara got mad at me, I didn't fight back. After she calmed down, I reassured her that I trusted her judgment. But now, things feel weird between us, and I hope we can work it out soon. It's been over three months since then, but Kara's behavior has been puzzling. She oscillates between giving me the cold shoulder and acting like her usual self. Despite my attempts to address the issue, she attributes her demeanor to her busy schedule and dismisses my concerns as overthinking. I've even asked if Julian's situation still bothers her, but she insists he's inconsequential. While her comments sting, I understand this is likely a passing phase. However, I can't shake the feeling that her coldness might stem from Julian ignoring her advice, or perhaps there's something else bothering her that she's not sharing. As I mentioned in the comments, I decided to let this phase run its course. I focused on my work, hit the gym, and set personal goals. However, last week marked Julian's birthday, a detail I wouldn't have known if not for social media. I called him to wish him well, and he seemed happy but reserved. He mentioned wanting to meet for lunch, which struck me as unusual for a 25-year-old unless there was something significant on his mind. During our lunch, Julian appeared uneasy, prompting me to inquire about his well-being in his workplace. Despite his reassurances, his demeanor betrayed a deeper concern. Eventually, he confessed noticing Kara's closeness to her boss, the creative head. They often shared lunches and coffee breaks, and Kara would leave the office early with him, sparking office gossip. As Kara's in-law, Julian felt troubled by these rumors, especially since his relationship with me deterred colleagues from gossiping about Kara in his presence. Yet, as he confided in me, he admitted to feeling conflicted about sharing office gossip. In a moment of urgency, I pressed him for certainty, watching as he nervously interlaced his fingers, his apologies flowing in waves. His reluctance to divulge details initially stemmed from a fear of causing me harm, only relenting under my persistent prodding. Tentatively, he floated the possibility that the situation was mere hearsay, shadowed by the necessity of accompanying his boss to client meetings, suggesting Kara's absences could be justified by legitimate work obligations. The weight of his words left me reeling, struggling to process the influx of information, compounded by Julian's own uncertainty and the lack of tangible evidence to confront Kara. Arriving home, the turmoil within me refused to settle, leaving me adrift in a sea of disorientation. Even the simplest acts, like sharing a meal with Kara, became strained as I mechanically picked at my food, lost in my thoughts. Kara's concerned inquiries fell on deaf ears as I retreated further into my cocoon of isolation, unable to find solace even in sleep. It was in the dead of night, shrouded in a blanket of uncertainty, that I found myself blurting out the question that had been gnawing at me, why had she resisted Julian's inclusion in her agency? Kara's reaction was one of surprise, her defensiveness palpable as she sought to deflect my inquiries. Yet, as the tension ebbed, her admission tumbled forth, revealing Julian's conservative inclinations and his penchant for exerting control over the women in his orbit. Suddenly, the pieces began to click into place, the puzzle of Julian's character taking shape before my eyes. 
As I reflected on Kara's revelation, a pang of guilt washed over me, questioning whether my judgment had been clouded by blind trust. Julian's past behaviors, the subtle criticisms veiled in concern for my sister's choices, echoed in my mind, casting a shadow of doubt over my convictions. Despite my allegiance to Kara, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that Julian's instincts might hold merit. In the wake of these revelations, I found myself grappling with a dilemma, torn between loyalty and the pursuit of truth. Yet, as the dust settled, I resolved to heed the wisdom of those who had offered their counsel, taking tentative steps toward unraveling the tangled web of deceit and suspicion that threatened to engulf me. And so, armed with newfound resolve, I ventured forth into the murky depths of uncertainty, guided by the faint glimmer of hope that clarity awaited on the horizon. I told Julian it was okay if he wasn't sure about what he thought. I said even if he was wrong, it wouldn't make me mad. But if he was right, it would be a big help to know. After some convincing, he agreed to check things out, but he wasn't sure if he'd find anything. A few days later, Kara came home from work all angry. She said I was using Julian to spy on her. She was really mad and even threatened to get Julian fired if he didn't stop. I asked her why she was so upset, but she just said I should know what I was doing. She told me Julian had been watching her everywhere she went, like at the cafe or when she took a break on the terrace. I felt frustrated. Why would Julian do that? I hoped Julian was wrong about Kara. I told her I'd talk to Julian and sort things out. But then, Kara's dad called me out of the blue. He said he was worried about Julian bothering Kara at work. I was shocked. How did he know? I asked Kara if she'd talked to her dad about it, and she said yes, because she trusted him. Kara's dad is super protective of her, almost too much. He's the kind of dad who'd do anything to keep his daughter safe, even if it means going overboard. I get it, but sometimes he takes it too far. I tried to settle things down with Kara, but she was still mad. She thought it was okay to talk to her dad about it. I promised I'd talk to Julian soon. The rest of the week was pretty quiet, but I couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling. When the weekend finally rolled around, I met up with Julian to talk about everything. I started by thanking him for caring, but before I could say much, he interrupted me. He had something important to show me. Opening his laptop, he played a video clip that made my stomach twist. It showed Kara and her boss in an elevator, and he was touching her inappropriately. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There were even more clips showing similar behavior in other parts of the office. I couldn't watch it all. I asked Julian to send me the files and how he got them from the workplace CCTV. He said he had friends who helped him hack into the cameras in secluded areas. When I got home, Kara asked if I talked to Julian. I told her I did and advised him to stay out of her business with her boss. My voice got louder without me realizing it. She tried to play the victim, saying Julian hated her. I didn't buy it. I showed her the videos, and she was shocked for a moment before getting defensive. She threatened Julian for invading her privacy and said she'd report the security department for leaking the footage. It didn't make sense to me. She insisted the videos were fake and told me to check before ruining her reputation. I told her I knew about her visits to hotel rooms with her boss, bluffing that I had hired a private investigator. It was a lie, but she fell for it. She tried to explain it away as business, but I couldn't believe she was dismissing it so easily. It felt hypocritical considering how she talked about women's empowerment. I told her I was done with our relationship and left the house, telling her to leave too. I stayed in a hotel for the night and flew to Florida the next day. I needed to get away. I called a friend who's a lawyer and told him everything. He said he'd send divorce papers to her parents' house within a week. Now, I just want to get the divorce over with, even though I know it won't be easy. I'm not sure how I'll handle it or if I'll even make it through. I'm truly grateful for the unwavering support I've received from everyone during this tumultuous time. While I was still in Florida, my lawyer took the necessary steps to initiate the divorce process by sending the papers to Kara's parents' address. Shortly thereafter, I found myself on the receiving end of an unexpected and rather heated phone call from Kara's father. In a barrage of accusations, he hurled insults at both me and my nephew, branding us as chauvinistic and selfish. He even went so far as to insinuate that the divorce stemmed from my jealousy of Kara's successful career. Needless to say, his words left me utterly perplexed. When he eventually paused to catch his breath, I couldn't help but question whether he truly understood the gravity of the situation. 
Gathering my thoughts, I calmly informed him that his assumptions were far from the truth. I reiterated that I had concrete evidence to support my claims, evidence which I had already shared with him during our call. With a calm demeanor, I urged him to check his phone for the undeniable proof. As the line fell silent, I could only imagine his reaction upon viewing the videos I had sent him. Subsequently, there was another period of silence, presumably as he grappled with the weight of the evidence presented before him. In that moment, I couldn't help but feel a pang of regret that he had to bear witness to such distressing footage involving his own daughter. However, I made it clear that I had no choice but to disclose the truth. It was imperative that I stood up for myself and refuse to shoulder the blame for actions I hadn't committed. After all, I was the aggrieved party in this unfortunate scenario. Upon my return home, I discovered that Kara had vacated the premises. Nevertheless, her departure didn't signal an end to the turmoil. Instead, she vehemently opposed the divorce proceedings and brazenly asserted her demands for alimony and a share of the marital home. In response, my lawyer swiftly countered her alimony claim, underscoring the immense mental anguish I had endured as a result of her actions. Furthermore, he aptly pointed out the factual reality that our marriage had been brief and that Kara had made no financial contributions towards the acquisition of the property. Consequently, she had no grounds to stake a claim to it. As the legal battle rages on, I find solace in the progress I've made since the revelation of Kara's indiscretions. Despite the ongoing challenges, I remain resolute in my pursuit of justice and closure. While I may not have embarked on a new romantic relationship, I am steadfastly committed to self-improvement, particularly in overcoming the drinking habit that I regrettably developed during my tumultuous stint in Florida. Your patience and empathy in listening to my story are deeply appreciated. It's through the support of friends, both old and new, that I find the strength to navigate these turbulent waters. Second Story Hey there, I'm chatting with my girlfriend over FaceTime, just like any other day. She's at home, and I'm just chilling, dozing off for a bit. But when I wake up and head to the bathroom, something strange catches my attention. I start hearing these weird sounds coming from her end of the call. It's like moaning mixed with swishing noises, almost like someone's using mouthwash. I try to brush it off at first, but the sounds continue for about five minutes. I start to wonder if I'm mistaken, so I decide to ask her about it, trying to keep things light and friendly. I casually inquire what she's up to, not wanting to sound suspicious. She responds, saying she's just lying down, but those noises are still bugging me. I go quiet for a moment, trying to process it all, and then she mentions she's not feeling well. This catches me off guard because she hadn't mentioned being sick before. But instead of pressing further, I decide to play it cool. I tell her I'm muting myself because I might snore, which is a total lie. In reality, I'm still listening intently, trying to figure out what's going on. And then, I hear those same strange noises again. It's like something out of a movie, or maybe a Twitter post. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Could it be that I'm being cheated on while on a simple phone call? It's unbelievable. So, I start thinking about what to do next. Oh, by the way, she lives about 17 minutes away viaduct the toll road, which adds another layer of complexity to the situation. Update time, I decide to drive over to her place while staying on the call with her muted. As I make my way there, I can't shake off the feeling of doubt and uncertainty. What if I'm wrong? What if she's genuinely not feeling well? But deep down, I know that gut feeling is usually right, urging me to investigate further. I arrive at her place and immediately start scanning the surroundings for any signs of unfamiliar cars. Surprisingly, I don't see any, which only adds to my confusion. Could I be imagining things? Is there a logical explanation for all this? But that nagging feeling persists, pushing me to keep digging deeper into this mystery. I muster up the courage to knock on her door, my heart pounding with anticipation. There's no answer at first, but I can hear movement and muffled voices from inside. I knock again, and this time, her phone suddenly gets muted, and our conversation comes to an abrupt halt. Alarm bells start ringing in my head. Something is definitely off. Finally, she opens the door, her expression one of surprise. I try to play it cool, casually mentioning that I wanted to drop by and see her. But deep down, I'm filled with a sense of dread. As we exchange pleasantries, I can't shake off the feeling that something isn't right. It's like there's an invisible barrier between us, a barrier she's desperately trying to maintain. I subtly try to make my way inside, but she blocks my path, her body language tense and defensive. 
We lock eyes for what feels like an eternity, the tension between us palpable. And then, she hits me with a line about not being allowed to have anyone inside, despite bending the rules in the past. But I'm not buying it. My instincts are screaming at me to push further, to uncover the truth. So, I stand my ground, insisting that something doesn't add up and that I need to see for myself. But she's adamant, her protests growing louder with each passing second. It's like she's trying to gaslight me into believing that everything is fine, but I'm not falling for it. In a moment of clarity, I decide to take matters into my own hands. With a sense of determination, I gather up all the belongings I've ever given her, a silent reminder of the trust that's now been shattered. As I leave, she follows me, her pleas falling on deaf ears. I can't help but feel a mix of emotions, anger, betrayal, and sadness, washing over me. As I drive away, leaving behind a whirlwind of unanswered questions, I can't help but wonder how I ended up in this mess. And as her incessant calls continue to flood my phone, I realize that sometimes, the hardest part isn't uncovering the truth, it's finding the strength to walk away from it. Man, I'm really stuck on how to deal with this situation. The way everything happened is just not right. It's not just bad for her, it's also really hurting me. I've decided I'm not going to talk to her anymore. I've found my own closure, and I'm not going to let her have the satisfaction of getting hers. Plus, the guy who was involved, he came to me and said he had no clue she had a boyfriend. He thought they were just chatting casually when she was talking to me. It's all so weird. And get this, the whole school seems to know about what she did, and a lot of people are backing away from her because of it. It's not something I'm celebrating, but it's like karma has finally caught up with her. Third story. I was 30 years old, and me and my wife, let's call her Sarah, were both the same age. We've been married for six years. During those six years, we did everything together. We traveled, ate meals together, and spent almost every evening side by side. But in 2019, things started to feel off. It all began early in the year when I had to leave town for a work conference. It was the first time I'd been away from home overnight without Sarah. She suggested her friend, let's call him Mark, who's 29, to come over and stay while I was away. Now, they were pretty close, and I knew they'd been more than just friends before I met Sarah. I said no firmly, pointing out that Mark hadn't visited us in all the six years we'd been together, except for that one time I was away. She got mad, but she seemed to respect my decision. But things got stranger as the year went on. Towards the end of 2019, we went to the movies, and I noticed Sarah sending messages to someone on her Apple Watch during the film. This was unusual for her. Though I couldn't see exactly what she was typing, the messages seemed too intense for just a co-worker at her new job. After the movie, I brought it up, but she brushed it off. Her behavior started to change too. She'd sit away from me on the couch, or go to another room to change, making me wonder if something was up. By January 2020, my suspicions were eating away at me. I knew I had to check her phone, but I felt guilty even thinking about it. What if I was wrong? It could ruin our marriage. But after days of wrestling with it, I decided to go ahead. I managed to access her watch, and she'd set the passcode to our anniversary, ironically enough. What I found on her phone was shocking. Sarah and Mark were chatting about her encounters with a coworker, and they were making fun of me for not knowing. Sarah was saying things like the thought of me touching her made her sick, and she couldn't imagine having kids with me. It was like a punch to the gut. The messages between Sarah and this coworker, let's call him Carl, were explicit. She was showing him more affection in every way than she was showing me. Each message was like a dagger, revealing more hurtful details. She even used a trip she claimed was to support a friend as an excuse to meet up with Carl. It was devastating. I couldn't sleep that night. I stayed up until the early hours, reading and taking pictures of everything. When Sarah went off to work the next day, I called a lawyer. I needed to know my options. When she got home, I confronted her, sharing what I knew without mentioning that I'd gone through her texts. It was one of the hardest conversations I've ever had. I mentioned that I noticed a mark on her neck, pretending it was a hickey, although it wasn't true. But then she talked about it in the messages, proving otherwise. When I confronted her about it, Sarah denied it at first, trying to argue that someone else gave her the mark. But then, I read a message from her watch, hoping she'd break down and confess. Instead, she exploded in anger over me invading her privacy. The way she twisted things to make me the bad guy left me stunned. 
She stormed out of the house and disappeared for three days, not letting me know where she was even though I asked her to share her location. Up until now, I only have a partial understanding of where she went or what she did during that time. When she returned, she said she wanted to work things out and spend some time together. But things took a bad turn when I caught her sneaking off to meet him once more, and she foolishly left her watch behind, allowing me to read their messages in real time. By February 2020, I finally told her that I'd spoken to a lawyer. She insisted she wouldn't agree to anything until we went to couples counseling. I agreed, but it quickly became a mess when I explained that we were there because she had an affair. She argued about my choice of words, suggesting that affair was too strong. She also lied about cheating on me prior to Carl with a married man, something I discovered later by checking her watch again. She admitted her plan was to find an apartment and then give me divorce papers without me knowing what was happening. She even tried to shift the blame for the affair onto me, using minor disagreements as evidence of my supposedly cold and uncaring behavior. At this point, the decision became clear. I needed to divorce her, as she'd never tell the truth. We agreed that Sarah would leave our house, and I even helped her find an apartment. I was willing to do anything to speed up her departure from the house. In March 2020, I witnessed the news about the onset of COVID, and all construction work halted, including the renovation of her apartment, which was nearly ready. This left her with nowhere to go. From March to June 2020, I was stuck in the house with her. To clarify, she knows enough about legal stuff to realize that leaving could complicate her case and cost her money. Those few months were incredibly tough. Trying to do my job and live in the same house with someone who hurt me and made fun of me was sometimes unbearable. We tried our best to keep things civil and avoid yelling when we ran into each other. Imagine spending over 90 days cooking meals, passing each other by, and seeing nobody else but the person who ended your marriage and broke your heart every single day. I pretty much locked myself in a room for about 8 hours. Then, I kept busy with yard work or exercise to avoid having to interact with her. She mostly moved out in late June when the world began to reopen slightly, and she had all her stuff out by July. Knowing I wanted to keep the house, she manipulated the situation to her advantage to avoid being criticized publicly. To this day, her family doesn't know what led to the divorce. She didn't tell her parents about it until after the papers were signed. She basically pressured me into pretending we were still together until that point. Then, I told her she needed to tell her parents, or I would. Her parents never asked about the cause, although a couple of them wished me well. I didn't feel the need to tell them the reason because despite the pain and manipulation she caused, I didn't want to hurt them. Her parents never did me wrong. Carl and Sarah's relationship didn't last. When I found out, Carl urged her to leave me and be with him. However, she tried to fix things between us, and he ended things with her, leaving her with nobody. Sarah and I rarely talk now, except when it's absolutely necessary, which isn't often. At times, I've wondered if it was a mistake not to publicly expose her infidelity. The people who matter to me know the truth. I also never confronted or even spoke to Carl or Mark, or her friend who knew about all of this but didn't warn me. As for me, i found someone who's genuinely good, and we have a strong relationship. I haven't told Sarah about it because it's not her business, just like I didn't tell her family about her cheating. I thought about telling Sarah how well I'm doing, but I believe that would just be taking pleasure in her misfortune. Don't forget to subscribe, like and click on the little bell icon for notifications of new stories.